keep drinking this motherfucker malt liquor, I'm going to need a haircut. That's just, I don't even, that doesn't even make any sense. <laughs> it's, you know, it's one of those things that, like, like they always say, this stuff will put hair on you or something. Hush. <laughs> How about let's? You know what we should do? We should install a Xeon seven seven uh, one socket Xeon that is in a socket seven seven five motherboard. And Sir Mushroom here has discovered that you can do this by just adding a little sticker. What the, what's this? You add a sticker <laughs> yeah, on the bottom. You what need the hell? To, apparently Intel anticipated that people would be crazy enough to do this, so they flipped two of the pins between the two sockets, and this sticker will switch the two pins back so that you can run a Xeon a seven seven one Xeon on a 775 motherboard. Now, if you're still rocking a 775 motherboard, especially like a Core 2 Duo, this might be a really easy, awesome upgrade for you because for about five bucks, you can get the sticker shipped to you. And uh, this the uh, 9650, a Q9650 equivalent Xeon, you can get on eBay, at least before the video, for between 60 and $85. Um, so uh, less than a hundred bucks for a Q9650. If you don't want to upgrade anything else, go on from like a Core 2 Duo. That's a heck of an upgrade. You know, it's funny. It's like a couple of days ago, Steel Valor, and a lot of you guys out there in, in the community know Steel Valor. He emailed me and he's like, hey man, I've got an old 775, got upgraded. What should I get? And I was like, 9650, go for it. Actually, I said 9590 and he was like an AMD. I was like, oh, no, 9650. So he made fun of me for a little while for recommending putting an AMD part in his Intel <laughs> system, but after that was over, uh, you know, I recommended the 9650, but this is kind of interesting. I'm not sure if he would have gone for this because he wants something stable that he knows is going to work. He doesn't have to mess around with it, but if you're someone who likes to tinker around, this could be a really interesting thing to play with, and also if you have old hardware around that you just like to tinker with, that's another reason to pick it up. So That would be a cool. lot of fun. I mean, I have all the stuff for this just laying around, and it's like, I should get this adapter for five bucks. Just try it. Just see what happens. Yeah. You, you, now, they've got a list of motherboards. Not every motherboard is compatible, and there are mm, ramifications, let's say, at, at the BIOS level. So you really want to check the compatibility list unless you're really adventurous in terms of motherboards that support doing this and will have the appropriate BIOS and, and microcode pieces to support this and chipset and all that other stuff. Speaking of motherboards, IBM is getting a really nice, uh, I guess, kind of a shot in the arm from Google right now uh, because Google has developed their own Power 8 uh, processor compatible motherboard there with dual, dual slots right there. It, and this is going to be a pretty good competitor for Xeon, uh, but I, you know, IBM has their own Power PC, and the, this is the Open Power Foundation, uh, which, which Google is a member of. And they developed this pretty crazy looking motherboard here. And this is mainly for servers. This really shows you what they do for a lot of their homegrown servers. It gives you an idea of, look at all those slots, man. That doesn't even make sense. <laughs> it's for video cards to do computation. Guarantee yeah. it. Wow. And they're, they're probably back to back. Like one's turned one way and the other's turned the other way. Yeah. So they can run double width cards, you know, back to back and it not be a big deal. So this is the way Google kind of does things. They just, they just create boards like this. And, you know, I, have, I haven't seen a lot of Google boards. That's one of the main reasons I wanted to talk about this is a lot of their hardware is stuff that they just develop themselves. It looks kind of ridiculous. Maybe it's even a little bit sloppy, but it's made for one purpose, to do something as quickly as possible. And a lot of times they don't spend that much money on their hardware. They just get something almost slopped together. Uh, and, and then it's all, all the software. It, the software is where the beauty is, you know what I mean? Uh, and, and then they usually have it set up so that if one of these things goes bad, they just swap it out and it just keeps going. So... It's interesting to see that Google is supporting IBM's platform here. And, and that'll be, I guess, I, I, I kind of like this because now the ARM is going to have um, some, uh, some com competition. I'm talking about the 64-bit ARM processors and then the Xeon chips, the x86 Xeon chips, are going to have some competition as well. I mean, PowerPC was a competitor, but this is a um, pretty good shot in the arm, I think. It, it may be down to performance per watt, mm -hmm. or there may be reliability implications here. I'm not really sure. I, I thought Google had done a really amazing job making the, the crappiest, most unreliable hardware really resilient in software. But it looks like there are things about the uh, power architecture and about some of the hardware options they have with this platform that make it attractive, not just from a particular standpoint, but also a performance per watt standpoint. You know, while we're talking about, I don't know, motherboards and CPUs, let's go ahead and talk about AMA's new, hey, AMA, AMD's new Bima and Mullins, their uh, SOC parts. 
and it's supposed to be high performance. Now these parts are from the um, uh, Cabini line, and um, it's it's basically just a refresh. You know, like this is the the new version of the Cabini parts, but they've done more than just add you know a couple hundred megahertz or whatever. They've gone in and they've done some pretty interesting things here uh, for these SOC parts. Now that now they have turbo cores, so you, they can they can boost up to 2.4 gigahertz um, for the for the Bema, and then um, uh, the tablet can boost as far as 2.2 gigahertz. They've also added something called the ARM Trust Zone, and that's really, really similar to Intel's uh, trusted computing technology. It's like their their platform mostly geared towards businesses and that sort of thing. Um, but the main thing that they've done here is they've improved, just like you said before, they've improved the power uh, per watt, or not power, the, the performance per watt, actually. Um, and they've also reduced some of the leakage before. Um, there was a bit of power leakage before, and they've improved that quite a bit by, they say, 19%. So that's kind of interesting to see. Um, I haven't seen any tablets with these parts in them, but uh, I'd be up for it, AMD. If you have one laying around, you want to send. That would probably be the best thing. I think that's probably where this is going. I thought it was really, you know, when I first read about the uh, trusted computing option, the core that's in this thing, it's based on ARM. It's an ARM Cortex A5. Yeah, so I thought that was really interesting because it's like, oh, wow, maybe they're doing hybrid ARM x86 at least they're getting experience doing that although i was thinking running android and something else you know like it's your android coprocessor that's or, what i was hoping for but that's not it's not what that is but you know it's like my imagination for a second was like oh this is gonna be really cool and it's, no it's not what it is it's it's more akin to the arm that you would find on a standard issue smart card than uh the arm that you would find in you know a cell phone of yesteryear yeah, it'd be really cool if they actually had, you know, the, the x86 SOC um, processor, and then they also had, like, a, a real nice ARM processor on there to run Android apps. But that would that would drive the price up quite a bit, but I think a lot of people would pay for it if they could have the versatility of running Android apps as well as x86 apps. But I'm not sure how, what kind of a... They'd have to have a dual boot between Android and Linux or something. I don't know. I don't know that, that it needs, a, that's it kind needs of a dual boot exactly, but... Much like when Windows, in not really Windows, but sort of Windows popularized the clipboard, there's going to be some kind of clipboard functionality between Android and Windows on a dual boot device. But from what I understand, Microsoft has absolutely lost their minds on the whole dual boot device thing. And the, there were vendors that actually had dual boot laptops ready to go, and they just they just put an ARM chip in there because there was room. And then Microsoft just lost their mind and their head exploded and fire came out of their eyes. <laughs> That's usually the way it goes with, with Microsoft. Yeah. It's all Let's fun talk. and games until somebody has to have emergency eye surgery. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I already miss him. Do, do you miss him? I mean, yeah. Yeah, Balmer's gone. Balmer's I don't Balmer, know. Man. Let's talk about monitors for a minute. Uh, Asus has a 4K monitor coming out. It's a 28-inch a 4K monitor, and everyone seems to be releasing these uh, TN panel 4K monitors that are under a thousand dollars. And the ASUS monitor was expected to sell for around seven hundred and ninety-nine dollars, and they just said it's going to be six hundred and forty-nine dollars. Now compare this to the one that I just bought from Dell. I forgot the model number, but I paid around six hundred bucks for it. It's thirty hertz. It's a TN panel, and uh, you know it's 4K and it's single tile, but they could not do. Um, you know, 60 hertz. This one is supposed to be single tile as well, meaning you're not going to have to go into your properties and configure two monitors and then, you know, string them together with Ifinity or some nonsense like that. It's going to work as one monitor. So, you know, as long as you have like a decent enough connection, like the, the, the newest version of DisplayPort or HDMI 1.4 or whatever, but it'll work as one tile, 28 inches, 4K, 60 hertz. That is pretty interesting. And the reviewer here on Tech Report says... That the monitor, of course, it's TN, but he said that it is a really, really good-looking TN. It's, it's an 8-bit TN panel, but Asus says that the dithering pushes the bit depth to 10-bit territory. And until I see it with my own eyes, I, I can't believe it because, it, you know, of course, Asus says that their own product is amazing. Holy crap, <laughs> you know. Um, the, the, every company is always going to say that their own product is amazing. Um, but also the, the viewing angles with TN is pretty rough. And, and there's a picture on here showing... You know how it looks from a pretty extreme angle. You, you can see some of the color, uh, you know, changing there, the color shift, but not as bad as it, it seemed to be with the uh, Dell monitor I had. I don't know. This this could be a very interesting, inexpensive option, so long as they, um, so long as there's no um, 
input lag <laughs> or, or uh, mouse latency. My God, 200 millisecond latency. Yeah, pretty bad. I don't know. You think it's time to, to get one of these yet, or are you still waiting for IPS at an affordable price? Well, if Asus will send us one, we'll be glad to review it. Ah, waka waka the, waka. You know those things always come with return labels. <laughs> well, no, so, I mean, I don't care. Right? So I just want to yeah, look at it and play it, with yeah. it. I mean, 650 I, I want one. I want to buy one. 650 for a TN panel seems pretty reasonable, but I also think that 4K monitors are going to drop in price crazy fast, probably faster than, than anything we've seen in a while because... 4K is not like 1440p because 4K is 4X 1080p and all the manufacturers have been ramming 1080p down our throats forever and the 1440p was more of an enthusiast part but I think 4K is going to not not be like 1440p was. You know, I'm not exactly sold on 4K for a lot of different reasons. Well, first off, the Dell monitor pissed me off and I made a review talking about it. It was probably the most negative review I've ever made but now you're telling me that there's a firmware fix because I just finished the review and then found out that there might be a firmware fix for the um, the latency. Just the mouse lag on the screen was horrible. So Absolutely terrible. It's unsubstantiated. But supposedly the revision on the Dell monitor A00 has the crazy input lag. And Rev A01 is basically a firmware upgrade to fix it. However, there doesn't seem to be a way to upgrade the firmware in the field. you got to send it back to them. So we don't know. We're going to try to call support on the A00, see what support says, see if we can get an A01, because we got all the documentation on how crappy the A00 is. If the A01 fixes it, then uh, that might be pretty neat. Yeah, it might be pretty neat, and then I'll have to re redo my review. However, if there's no fix for this, I'm going to send it back, but I'm also going to release the review with the stipulation that I received the A00 model. It's... It's man. It's. I think the review is pretty funny because I was. I, I was actually like. I was mad, man. I don't get mad in many reviews, but I really. I can't believe Dell would release a product with you know mouse lag that bad. It felt like my. It felt like my mouse was drunk. It was. It was terrible. It's like I'm trying to drag it through molasses. It was awful. But I'm also not sold on 4K just from the, um, the real estate standpoint because everything is so damn small. And if you're using 4K, you want all the real estate, but. All the, you know, the text is so small that you have to move the monitor very close. And then someone was like, well, just use a scaler, man, and have it scale up to be 1080p. It'll look like a much smoother version of 1080p because, uh, you know, the pixels are so small you can't see them. But that kind of defeats the purpose of 4K. I'd rather have 1440p and have all the real estate as opposed to having 4K and running it at 1080p mode where you have really good looking 1080p but you lose the whole idea of getting all the real estate. So that's kind of where my mind is right now with 4K. Maybe if we have a 4K screen that's 30 inches, 35 inches or something a little bigger so that, you know, it's, it's still a lot of pixels, but it's, it's big enough that you can see the text, then maybe I'll be really excited. Plus, I like big monitors like that. I don't know. What do you think, Wendell? I think 27 inches is sort of the minimum size for 4K, and you're going to have to have a monitor arm so you can get it close enough so that you can see the definition. I'm, I'm with you. I, I really want the screen real estate, which means that I want to operate close to 4K. Now, I might bump my font size up to deal with it and, and icon size and things like that, but anybody who's used Windows for any amount of time knows that that's sort of weird on Windows. On Linux and other operating systems, it's not really a problem. On Mac, it's getting to be not a problem because it looks like Apple's getting ready to roll out things like 4K displays with their kind of 1080p scaling, whatever, like they did with the Retina display. So eventually, it's not going to be as much of a problem as it is today. But mainly, I want the screen real estate. But the problem is the application manufacturers are going to resize their stuff to be larger. And so we're always playing this game. So maybe I need to wait for like the 5.5 or the 6K monitor because I really don't want to run applications that are quote-unquote redesigned for 4k or optimized for 4k that are just larger i don't want that i want i want more pixels yeah that's exactly where i'm at all right let's move on and let's talk about sony they are developing 185 terabyte tapes that's right tapes <laughs> 3700 times the amount of storage on a tape compared to a blu-ray disc um this is pretty wild and the way they're doing this is, well, you know what, let's just break right into it and I'll read what they're doing right here. So in order to do this new tape, uh, Sony has employed the use of sputter deposition. Isn't sputter deposition what you call like a, a lawyer in court who stutters or something or has a speech impediment? Uh, yeah. All right, moving right along here. So they use, quote-unquote, sputter deposition, which I'm not exactly sure that works because I'm not um, 
uh, I guess I'm not designing these things, but it creates uh, layers of magnetic crystals by firing argon uh, ions across a polymer film substrate. So essentially what they're doing is they're creating a soft magnetic underlayer and the magnetic particles are just 7.7 .7 nanometers. So that is the key here. Very, very closely uh, packed together. That, that's the key, 7.7 .7 nanometers. So all that junk that I just read that I only half understood basically means you could put 185 terabytes on a tape. The problem with tapes still is. So don't think that if you have like a massive collection of movies and stuff, you're gonna be able to you know, benefit from this because the problem is still gonna be uh, accessing your data. It's gonna take a long time and storing your data is going to take a very long time. The implications for this are probably gonna be, I don't know, maybe they could use these in Utah at the NSA's new facility. We've been talking about the FCC so much that we've totally forgotten about the, F about the NSA, but hey, they could probably use these things. <laughs> That's, this is honestly <laughs> the kind of thing that they probably would be, because spinning media and, you know, Amazon's got the glacier storage, which is probably some form of magnetic tape or something that that's sort of has hard drive caching or something like that. But I've always been really surprised because the tape, like if you just go to Dell and you look at like the RD1000 tape drive, it's a thousand bucks. And then you get like quantity three, you know, one terabyte, whatever, it's like $551. It's just hard drives. Like the, the tapes have crossed the threshold. And like when you're talking about one terabyte, two terabytes, three terabytes, it's easier and cheaper to just give people a hard drive in, in quote unquote, a tape form factor. It's really just an external hard drive with a, with a customized interface. But this is 185 terabytes. This is a whole other class of insanity. Oracle <laughs> really is. has some drives that are like this, but they're like the five terabyte capacity. But again, a lot of those solutions, by the time you factor in the cost of the drive and the cost of the cartridges, it's more expensive than an equivalent, you know, four terabyte or six terabyte mechanical hard drive. And so a lot of backup, a lot of companies have gone to just racks and racks of hard drives for their backup solution. And this is actually the first viable technology I've seen that is could actually be useful in a corporate scenario. I'm sure they'll, they'll have a lot of different capacities, but if they start at like 20 or 40 terabytes and go up from there and like the 20 terabyte, I mean, yeah, the 20 terabyte uh, tape drive is like, or the tape is like $20 or $30 or $40. That's completely reasonable. That's about where the price of, of tape should be. But it's not. It's going to be like $2,000 a cartridge or something ridiculous like that. I, I think some people are going to still pick it up just for the, uh, the just because it's going to save space. That's going to be the bottom line for them is that it's going to save them space. And uh, yeah, that's, that's it. All right, let's talk about something silly for a second. Gibson has developed a guitar cable that has a recorder built into the actual cable. It's got a digital recorder right there in the cable. And when I first saw this, I was like, this is ridiculous because it's gonna cost $100 for a guitar cable. And for a hundred bucks, I could probably get an interface that allowed me to connect my guitar to my computer and it would probably do a better job. And then I realized that this could be used for bands who have you know, a guitar player who needs to improve or a guitar player who wants to hear their own performance after the show. So you take this to a live show, you plug it in, and it gives you a clean recording of your own guitar. And then when you get back home, you can listen to it, analyze it, and know where you screwed up and how you can fix it. So it, it seems like it could be a, a cool, um, you know, thing. It takes a micro SD card and that can record. It comes with a, a four gigabyte micro SD card and that can record 13 hours. So um, if you guys are, you know, musicians out there and this interests you, let me know. So that's about all I'm going to say about that. Time to move on. Speaking back, back to storage. That was just sort of a... And aside there, in between all the storage, SanDisk has announced four terabyte SSDs, eight terabyte SSDs, and 16 terabyte SSDs are going to be coming out later in the year. And then the 16 terabyte SSDs are going to be coming out at the first of next year. The performance is about the same. It's about 500 read and 500 write. But now we're entering an age where SSDs are bigger as far as capacity goes uh, than mechanical hard drives. And I think that, that large SSDs like this are gonna be exactly what everyone wants because I, it seems like a lot of the, the four terabyte um, and, and even the six terabyte standard mechanical hard drives have an extremely high failure rate. I expect the failure rate on these SSDs to be way lower. And I mean, when you get an SSD this large, it also is going to have to have you know, some enterprise properties. Uh, I haven't totally read everything here, but hey, this is gonna be pretty crazy. We need to put them through the anvil test where we write lots and lots of information to them and see how they do. 
Yep. IOPS, not that bad. Um, you know, 90,000 IOPS on the, um, which one is this? Yeah, it's not too bad, the IOPS, but I've seen much better than this as far as the IOPS go. But what I'm waiting for are those uh, 16 terabyte SSDs. How much is that going to cost? <laughs> I'm pretty sure that the 8 terabyte one is probably going to cost about $5,000. Probably, probably going to cost all. It's just going to have a tag on it. When you go to the store, it's just going to say all of the money. That's what it's going to say right on the tag. All the money. How much does it cost? All, all the money. Just all of it. Yeah. All right. Let's move on here. And uh, let's, let's talk about cars for a minute. We've got a few really fun car segments right now. Mercedes is bringing their first electric vehicle to the USA. And what's really cool here is they've partnered up with Tesla. It's going to have a Tesla engine and a Tesla drivetrain. Did I just say the same thing twice? I don't know anything about cars. <laughs> so a drivetrain and engine, pretty much the same thing. They're kind of separate, I guess, right? I think so. I have no idea. Like, I don't know. I, I took my car to get, like, a taillight changed, and the guy looked at me like I was a moron and literally <laughs> reached in and just like, here, do you want to change it yourself? He just, like, grabbed it and, like, held it up for me. He's like, it's that easy. I just turned one screw and here. I was like, oh, yeah, I'll do that myself. <laughs> but nice I always guy. have, yeah, I don't know. He didn't charge me any money or anything. He was just like, here, could, do you mind doing it yourself? Because I'm busy. And I was like, can I give you 10 bucks? He's like, no. So that's how much I know about cars. <laughs> it's just, just to give you guys an idea. I'll build your computer, but. That's uh, really horrifying. Up, yeah. Well, I learned to change a tire. That's one thing you learn when you live in Miami. Miami has more road debris than just about anywhere else in the, uh, anywhere else in, I think, the country. Not, not the world, but in the USA. And driving around Miami, it was like a monthly and, and sometimes a bi-weekly thing where I would hit something and be like, ah, tire, blown, damn it. <laughs> everywhere, the interstate, there's just junk everywhere. People just drive around with piles of scrap metal and they leave the bed of their truck open so it just like flies everywhere. That's what it feels like. Anyway, so I can change a tire and um, that's it. I can pump gas. That's terrible. I feel like I should go learn something about cars. Anyway, back to this. Um, you're still going to have the same limitations that you have with Tesla being the, uh, the, um, the range, you know what I mean? Can't go too far, but it's really cool to see Mercedes developing an electric car, and it's also cool to see them working with Tesla. Hmm, makes me happy. All right, Google's self-driving car has reached 7,000, 7,000, 700,000 accident-free miles, and now their software can avoid cyclists and stop at railroad crossings. I would think that they would be able to drive 700,000 miles without worrying about railroad crossings in the first place. But Yeah, it was like, what? You mean it what? couldn't avoid pedestrians before? <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> or yeah, pedestrians it, it, on bicycles, I guess? It hasn't had any accidents, but it's killed 10 pedestrians. <laughs> uh, yeah. Pedestrians on bicycles, I guess, are not technically pedestrians, but... You know, there it's it's like a moving obstacle. I mean, hasn't anybody ever played Paperboy for the NES? I mean, <laughs> <laughs> extra points, man. <laughs> okay, so yeah, that's pretty cool. And uh, the last thing I want to show you guys is the Doom buggy that can fly right here. This is called Skyrunner, and I'm gonna go ahead and play the video and turn the volume down in the background. But this Doom buggy, okay, first off, it drives. It's a hybrid vehicle because it drives on the uh, the road, and then it can take off and fly through the air. And the way it takes off is it deploys a parachute. And then the parachute positions itself directly above the vehicle, and then we have liftoff. And uh, there's a large fan on the back, similar to what you would see on um, an airboat or something like that. A huge fan. I imagine it makes a bit of noise, but yeah, there it is. It's taken off right there. Skyrunner. And apparently this thing is a lot easier to land than a Cessna or anything like that. So pilots are going to find this extremely easy. I mean, the throttle is just your foot pedal, just like a car. And, you know, they said if you're coming down too fast and it looks like you're going to hit the ground, what you do instead of slamming into the ground is you give it a, you hit the gas a little bit, give it some acceleration, and you kind of, like, take off a little bit and then meet the ground. So as long as you've got enough room to do it, um, I can't wait for one of these. I, I fly these things around in the mountains and I'll be dead so fast. <laughs> yeah, this, <laughs> this would go not be good. The mountains. you got to get a flat area for these. It's, it's basically a paraglider. It's a, it's a powered paraglider. With a dune buggy, or it's a dune buggy paraglider, I guess. I don't know. I think it looks pretty cool. I, I, I really want one of these things. Wow. It's got like an Android tablet in the middle of it or something. So that's that. NASA has some new spacesuits, and these things are styled after Tron, but they don't want to say Tron because they don't want to get sued. Uh, but here's NASA's new uh, spacesuit. It's, um, what's, what's the uh, model number here? It's the Z2 spacesuit. Go ahead and open it up here so you guys can see it. I think it looks kind of interesting. Now, the Z1 did not have a hard outer shell for the top half here, for the torso here. The torso has a very hard shell. Uh, this is also 100% uh, sealed. It's a, you know, completely, the, the environment's completely a vacuum. 
And um, yeah, this is what we're going to need when we run around different planets. Like the sun. That's my favorite planet. <laughs> uh, I don't think these are going to help you if you're running around the sun. Uh, it says right here, somewhere in the article, it's uh, for exploration and colonization of the, the, the sun. At no. least, uh, yeah. And then, the, never mind. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so um, I think it looks pretty cool. And uh, I don't know, you guys tell us what you think in the comments. This guy's so proud to be wearing this in the middle of Arizona or wherever the hell he's modeling it. But um, they're going to start testing on this very soon. And um, maybe we'll see this in space in the near future. All right, let's talk about an MIT technology review article. There's a small startup called Ultra Haptics, and uh, Ultra Haptics is creating sound waves that allow you to feel objects that are not there. That's what they're trying to do. Um, now, the applications for this are almost endless. We could have stuff like we see in, um, oh, like these sci fi movies where they project things in midair and then you interact with the air. The problem for me with interacting with the air is like, how do you know what keys you're hitting or what buttons you're hitting? You're just flailing your arms around like this, like they did in like Minority Report and that sort of thing. But with something like this, um, they use basically sound waves. It feels like a little air pulse on your fingers, but it actually creates some feedback. I think that's kind of interesting. I'm not exactly sure how the technology works, but you, you know, they get into the article. It doesn't get extremely nerdy here, but it says they are doing some tests right now uh, where they're using the ultrasound array uh, and they're focusing in on different parts of people's hands, like people hold their hands like this open and they try to figure out if people can tell exactly what's happening on their hand by directing different pulses of ultrasonic sound waves. So, ultrasonic or what, what am I saying here? Did I say the right thing? Yeah. Yes, it, no. It looks promising. Yeah, ultrasound, yeah. But I would be curious to know how they're able to direct the sound that exactly. I mean, it almost seems like they would have to have a couple of emitters and the place where the, the waves cross one another is like where the sensation would be created. But it looks really promising. But I want to know more about how the technology works because it seems almost too good to be true. All right, so another article here on uh, MIT News caught my eye. And this, um, this article, they're talking about a new material that's very similar to graphene, except this material uh, is not made out of the same things. And it has a few different properties, but this, this article here is a just extremely uh, light on, on the details. So uh, I'm not really sure what the takeaway here is. It looks like this, this material is going to do several things that graphene cannot do, and it can also um, possibly work better for stuff such as, um, I don't know, like uh, solar cells and that sort of thing. But I, I didn't really get too much out of it. But it, it, the thing here for me is that it's cool to see that we have now more... Um, stuff coming out that's similar to graphene and has similar properties. And they say that this thing has some properties that graphene does not have that are it's very desirable for some situations. I don't, I don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yeah, the article's really light on details. And so it seems like in situations where you need to manufacture a solar cell that has some transistor logic on board, like maybe you could do voltage regulation or maybe you could do some other sort of control or monitoring circuit that's you know part of the same etching lithography process, this might be useful for that, but the article is kind of light on details. It's similar to graphene in that um, it is sort of tubes in carbon, but there's a lot more support material around the tubes, and that creates some sort of band gap property, which I guess is useful in, for semiconductors and things like that. But this article for the MIT News, this article is really, really light. So if anybody has any more info about that, let us know. It looks interesting. But, uh... Yeah. Let, let, me, let me ask you a question. Have you seen this new axe from Finland? I'm just going to mention this briefly because I know we have a lot of viewers uh, from, well, uh, so not Norse. That'd be uh, Nordic, I believe. Yeah, Nordic places. Finland's not Norse, if I'm correct. Finland, <laughs> Finland's Nordic? I don't know. We have a lot of viewers from <laughs> Scandinavia. <laughs> so, um, and we have a lot of viewers in colder environments, and this could be the axe that you need. So let me ask you, does your axe do some of the things that this does? Um, it's a 60-year-old inventor. I'm not even going to try to say the name of the axe. I'll just highlight it here on the screen because I'll botch it with my terrible American uh, accent and, and misunderstanding. But check out what this axe can do. It doesn't get stuck. It, I, it's, I don't know. I just really get excited about this kind of stuff in science. So, yeah. If you guys need an axe, just get one of these. It looks cool. This is probably the kind of, like, on the next Star Trek series... 
when the captain is all stressed out and needs a holiday in the woods, <laughs> this is the axe you're going to see. Exactly. All right, so moving right along here. Um, X-rays. Okay, X-rays could take the place of uh, CAT scans and MRIs very soon. I'm not sure if that's going to be something the medical field is excited about or not because that's that's too fewer things that they now they, they can't bill for those things on the insurance. But there's a company out there. Um, it's called Materialise, yeah, and they have created some software that allows you to put together a 3D model based upon a few different X-rays. So you take a few different X-rays, it takes the information from the different angles and creates a 3D model. That is really cool. That'll save a lot of money um, as far as, you know, like I said, CAT scans and MRIs. And it'll also allow them to, you know, easily get information, whereas they normally would have to go through all this, you know, all, all these different tests and that sort of thing. Science, man. I don't what do they think of next? I don't know that this will really replace CAT scans and MRIs because... Those other technologies give you a lot of cross-sectional information that could be used to build 3D models as well. In fact, I think we had a, an article two or three episodes ago about a little girl that had a, a defective heart that was weird, and they, they had a hard time imaging it. So literally, they printed out a model of the girl's heart with a 3D printer. So there was like, you know, just thermoplastic model heart so that the surgeon could look at it and see what the surgeon was expected to do. And he's like, oh, yeah, no, I could totally do that. But they built that by hand from the imaging of normal medical imaging equipment. So I would be curious to know if this x-ray process is using multiple lateral slices to build it together, or if it's like in the diagram where it just looks like it's using like two angles to put it together. Right. I guess from that perspective, it wouldn't be able to replace MRIs for, you know, the advanced stuff like that where you need all the different slices. But if it does, I mean, who knows? It is interesting, but yeah, I guess I, I see your point there. All right, let's move on and talk about some more um, medical stuff. So some scientists have been experimenting with regrowing uh, muscle for a while now. And the problem is you, you can, your body regrows muscle. If something happens to your muscle, it, it regrows. But if there's serious trauma or if a, a large portion of the muscle is missing uh, or if there's a ton of scar tissue, it, it, it just cannot regrow properly. But scientists here have been experimenting, and they've actually successfully re regrown muscle uh, in disabled in a few men, a few young men with their disabled legs. And what they did to regrow it is they used sort of a scaffolding that they uh, they took it from I guess they took it from pigs, like you know, like cells. When all the cells are gone, there's still like a scaffolding there, and uh, they used the scaffolding to essentially build the structure of the legs, and then the cells regrew on top of the scaffolding. That's pretty wild. And again, this is over my head. But we it's saw still that, pretty wild. We saw that a couple episodes ago, but it turned out that it might have been, it might have been fraudulent. But there was somebody that was applying the same technique to hearts. It wasn't pig hearts, but they would take a human heart that was defective, and they would do something to it, and it would remove everything except the structural material. And then they painted it with stem cells, and then stem cells were like, "Oh, we need to become heart cells because the material was somehow communicating with the cells, telling them what they needed to be the support material." Don't know if that was actually legit. Uh, I read one article that said that that was not legit, but this looks like the same kind of thing, but with muscle tissue. So the first team may have been onto something with that. Yep. All right, Japan is thinking about building an orbital solar farm, and we've talked about this in the past, but now it seems like they're getting even more serious about this, and they're looking at ways to make it practical. Now, in the first place, they were talking about maybe using lasers. And the problem with using lasers is that if you have, like, a giant solar array that's floating up there, above the atmosphere. You'd have to beam all that power back down to Earth. And lasers, they need a, you know, it's a pretty fine or pretty short wave. So they would have to have a small area to catch this. And also, laser can be, I don't know, it can be messed up by atmospheric conditions. It can be messed up by uh, clouds or whatever. So it, it, was a, it would essentially be only a sunny day technology. Now they're talking about using the same sort of thing, but using microwaves to get the power back down to Earth instead, because microwaves are not really affected as much uh, by atmospheric conditions and by clouds. So you'd be able to get everything back down to Earth. Um, and that would also, I mean, that would do a lot as far as, you know, creating sustainable power goes. Um, it would do a lot as far as, I mean, right now the public over there is in, is in a state of mind where they they getting the power grid or getting I mean not the power grid but getting like a power plant floating around in outer space just sounds so much safer than 
another Fukushima, you know? So I think that's another reason why they're really considering something like this. Um, I haven't really considered all the, pitfall, the pitfalls of this. This is a huge article here. Uh, I don't know how dangerous a microwave can be or a microwave, you know, I'm not sure how <laughs> dangerous that is. Anybody that's ever played SimCity is thinking, well, that was the best technology, although it could wreak the most havoc when the beam was pointed to the slightly most, like, slightly off. So. Yeah, like, that's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking already right now there's someone writing a movie or there's a bunch of hackers together in a cave thinking, hey, what if we just could hack into that, you know, hack into that solar thing and just angle it a little bit over and start frying something? Or maybe we're angry, we're angry with a certain company. Let's just point it that way. Hmm. Damn it. We've put on our tinfoil hats again. In, in SimCity, it could easily take out half your city. <laughs> All right, we went there, but I'm going to move right along now. Let's talk about some gaming stuff. The Unreal Engine 4 has a, it's a, it's a benchmark that you can actually run on your own PC. And I just downloaded this, and I have not run this yet, but you can run the Elemental uh, benchmark demo. So just go ahead and download it here. here there's a link in the, uh, click on the top link in the description. That'll take you to our website where you can get the link for this. And, uh, you know, then you can start playing around with the Unreal Engine 4. I am really looking forward to the Unreal Engine 4. And I'm going to play this video because this is kind of cool. It's the PlayStation 4 versus a PC side-by-side -side comparison uh, with the Unreal Engine 4. And it is shocking, the difference here between the PC and the PlayStation 4. Let me go ahead and crank it up to 1080p and uh, in big in this. So the PC there is on the right and, you know, it looks pretty similar at first, but after you get into it, you can see the soft particles are much nicer. Um, I mean, the PlayStation doesn't look bad, but the, you get incredible depth of field on the PC. Uh, let me see some of the particle effects, because the PC can handle a lot more as far as that goes. Just going to fast forward a little bit. I also think that the... Um, there we go. Now we get some particles going. You guys are going to have to watch this yourself because you guys are watching a, a YouTube video that's played through another YouTube video, so you're not going to get the, uh, the full effect here. Both are very impressive. The PS4 is very impressive. Um, but man, yeah, you can see the particles going on over there with the PC. PlayStation 4 can't handle it, but damn, the, P the PlayStation 4 looks damn good. Anyway, enough of that. Um, the, the, the bottom line here is there are a lot of, of uh, Unreal Engine 4 games coming out. Uh, Unreal Engine 4 is now available for indie developers for like a very low monthly fee. We're talking like 20 bucks a month or something like that. So there's probably going to be a lot of games coming out that, that use this engine. Uh, it seems to be running pretty good on most hardware with, you know, moderate settings. So could be cool. Anyway, go download the, the benchmark and check it out on your own machine. And if you have the, uh, you know, crazy graphics, or crazy, crazy graphics cards, prepare for your eyes to melt. All right, The Witcher 3. Um, now, The Witcher 3, it'll make your eyes melt too, but, um, you know, it was delayed. And it seems that the reason that it was delayed was because the amount of content that's going into this game. I'm really looking forward to The Witcher 3. And I'll probably be playing that a lot. I'll probably be streaming it on, uh, on Twitch. I like open world games. Now, this does have um, a, a pretty large, somewhat linear story, you know, so they're saying 50 hours of gameplay, but the entire game itself has 100 hours of gameplay. So there's going to be a lot of different side quests um, and the amount of detail that they're putting into this world is pretty astonishing. The cities actually look like cities. I mean, one of the things I always felt in a lot of the role-playing games out there, when you get into a city, everything feels quaint and small, you know what I mean? This, the building's tower above your head, it really, it, it feels quite different to me. I just wish it was first person. I wish there was an option for first person. Maybe there will be, I don't, I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's, it's also going to be a mature game, uh, you know, with gritty content and that sort of thing. But um, there's 36 different endings. I think there was 14 endings in The Witcher 2. So that's, that's going to take a little bit of time. So that, that's probably why it was delayed. It really is encouraging to see these kind of gaming projects that are properly funded and huge, but also well put together and not rushed. And there's sort of a deep woven storyline. So we have really high expectations for this. The thing I like about CD Projekt, their philosophy is that they do things at their own pace they're not right now they're not beholden to any um publisher they're releasing this thing on their own and they're going to be releasing it on good old games as well as steam but they're they really like the drm free model on day one the witcher 3 is going to be drm free so they're putting it right on good old games and that's exactly where i'm going to buy it right on good old games i like having a, just an executable file that i can install on this machine or install on my other machine and not have to worry about it i really like that it makes me feel like i actually own something when i could just get an exe file 
that doesn't phone home, that just, it's mine. I can put it on a disc, I can put it on a hard drive, I can do whatever I want with it. Well, I guess if the disc is big enough, but you know what I mean. It makes me feel like I'm in control of my own stuff. I like that. <laughs> so, um, yeah. All right, let's talk about John Carmack. <laughs> Zinemax is claiming that they own key Oculus technology. Because John Carmack, you know, he worked for id. It is owned by Zinemax, or Bethesda, which is owned by Zinemax. And while John Carmack was there, all of the code that John Carmack wrote is property, you know, per, as per his contract, is property of Zinemax. So he was working on a lot of Oculus code while he's there, and apparently all that code that he worked on, and some of it is very key for the Oculus, is now property of Zinemax. Oops. <laughs> yeah. I mean, John Carmack tweeted, um, no work I have ever done has been patented. Zinemax owns the code I wrote, but they don't own VR. So. <laughs> yeah, I don't. He's probably with the state of things, the way that they are in America, he's probably in for a bad time. I'm not saying it's right. I'm just saying that the situation with code here is that the courts don't understand it. And I mean, we, look, we've got the, the whole Oracle API thing. An API is ostensibly designed to have other people use it. And the only reason Oracle lost there is because we had a judge who knew how to program. This is not going to go well for Mr. Carmack. Yeah, it, it could be pretty bad. I mean, even if even if he re rewrites the code in a totally different way, it could go the wrong way for him. Yes, because nobody understands. It's not right. <laughs> it's not how it should be. But that's exactly how it's going to play out. Speaking of Bethesda, uh, Wolfenstein, they have released the um, the system requirements here, and you guys can see them on the screen. Uh, let's, let's have the recommendations. I don't see the the recommendations. I, I never really care about the requirements. The requirements mean that you can run it at like ten frames per second without your machine melting. It'll actually install and run. But I don't see any recommended specs here, unless I'm crazy. Yeah, no, just the requirements. So I'm going to keep my eyes out for the recommended specs. And again, I'm, I'm still up in the air about this game. I'm not sure how I'm going to feel about it. Because, I, did I tell you about our experience we had with this game, Wendell, at, at PAX? No, what, what was it? We went to PAX, and we were, we were going to go in and, like, you know, we, we were media. They are like, hey, you guys can, can come in and play the game for a little while. You know, media, great. Okay, good. And they, they let a lot of different media companies videotape and stuff like that. So we get in there and they're like, oh, no cameras. I'm like, we're media. And they're like, uh, let me go ask Randy, you know. So they were like, oh, kind of weird about it. And then all, they had like 30 different stations all playing Wolfenstein. And they're like, here's your PS4 controller. And I was like, you guys have 30 stations and you don't have one mouse and keyboard? I can't even use this thing. I'm sorry. I, I just don't know how to do it. You know, I, I haven't played uh, an FPS on console since Turok 2. I, I can't do it. <laughs> so um, it was a pretty bad time. It was a really bad time. And we started recording a little bit, and then someone came and yelled at us, and we basically said, screw this, and left. I didn't really get a good feel for the game, and it kind of left a bad taste in my mouth that we have a, uh, you know, we were playing a PS4 version of a game that I was looking forward to on PC and a game that started on PC. It really, really did left a weird taste in my mouth. So, so screw you guys. <laughs> there. <laughs> it's story time with Logan. Yeah. You know what I'll be playing instead? I'll be playing a game called Hell Raid. It looks kind of like a mixture of, um, you know, one of the PC gamer guys said that it looks like Skyrim, but it does not look like Skyrim. It looks more like a medieval version of Painkiller. So, and it looks like a really fast-paced game. Maybe a little bit of Rune mixed in there. And the reason I wanted to bring this up is they've just switched to a brand new game engine. If you guys haven't seen this game, you guys should check it out. It's going to have some interesting multiplayer modes. It looks like a lot of really fun action combat with some RPG elements, uh, adventure mode, you know, like just... It looks like it's going to be a lot of fun. Two to four player co-op. Um, but what am I looking for? They, they switched to a new game engine. I believe it's called the, um, the Chrome engine. Yeah, the Chrome engine 6. So it's kind of cool to see a couple of games coming out with these, uh, these engines that are less used. So I'm keeping my eye on it. It looks like a really pretty game. They switched to the Chrome engine because it does a really good job with um, real-time, on-the-fly lighting and that sort of thing. Looks pretty. I'll be getting it. And probably playing some, you know, multiplayer online. Anyway, speaking of, I've talked about all these games. I'm dying to go play a game. I just downloaded the um, Lost Alpha from Stalker. Remember when back, way back when, like, I don't know, 19 or 2000 and something, they, they showed Stalker and it blew all of our minds. And then like 10 years later, it finally came out and it was a little bit nerfed from what they showed us in the first place. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah, it was well, kind of well, disappointing. I mean, Stalker was an okay game, but... It was a lot bigger in scope uh, in the first place. So a modder got his hands on the original alpha and it has more content, more zones, more stuff to do. It's just a bigger game, but it was never finished. 
He patched it up, finished it up, and he got the blessing from the guys who created the original game, and he released a mod that is completely standalone. It's like the original Stalker Shadow of Chernobyl. Chernobyl. Um, it's the, like the original game. It's way bigger. The graphics, he, it's, it's got support for DirectX 10.1, crazy, you know, like particle effects, you know, light rays, shadows on grass. It looks a lot better, and um, I'm dying to go play that about right now. Or Lich, so maybe I'll play one of the two. So, I've, been yeah. look, I've been looking for something, I don't, not that I have any time to play games, but looking for something distracting to take my mind off stuff. And I, I really haven't had a, a there's, there's really not a lot out right now that's, you know, really, really distracting. I'm still kind of bitter over the whole uh, Daisy standalone bait and switch, but eh, it is what it is. Yeah, I don't know. I, I started playing Hotline Miami, and I don't recommend it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the, I, I sat there and cursed, cursed at the screen for a long time, and everyone's like, you hate it so much, that means you really love it. And I was like, no, I, I really do hate it. It's, but it's got sort of a, an addicting thing. It's one of those games that makes you want to try again because it's so brutally frustrating. You know, and it's like, damn it, I must try again. But it's like, I'm not enjoying myself. I'm just cursing and punching the wall. I'm going to give, really give Dark Souls 2 a try when, I, when a really good coupon for it comes out. Yeah, that one uh, could be... I, well, I'm, I mean, again, I'm like, it's not that I hate, oh, I pushed the wrong button again. It's not that I hate frustrating games or repetitive games. I think there's something to be learned from games that force you to redo the same tasks over and over and then creatively solve problems, you know, like by failing 50 times in the same thing. I think there's something to be said for that. And I think it may even be good for businesses and societies to have generations of kids who have been raised on games that force, force them to try to solve problems in creative ways by failing over and over and over again. You know, it builds in sort of a tenacity, but right now I don't have time for it. I just want to, I want to experience something and have a little bit of fun because I've got so many other things. I, like right now in the real world, I am dealing with that stuff. You know, in the real world, you know, I'm failing over and over again, hitting brick walls and, and retrying things. So when I game, I want to, I want to relax a little bit. Not saying I want something that's easy, but just give me a quick save and uh, that way I won't have to redo <laughs> the same parts of a level 50 times. Quick save in uh, real life would be awesome. Yeah, it would be. Like, hey, I'm going to try this business decision. <laughs> Quick save. <laughs> if, only it w if only the holographic universe were a thing and we would be onto something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll end with that. And you guys can go read books on the holographic universe and discuss that versus string theory in the comments, <laughs> please. <laughs> How about it? All right, guys. Uh, thanks a lot for the tech support. We'll see you guys next uh, thing that we do online. We'll see you there. Bye.